Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Clover Hill Church. Can we make some noise and welcome anyone joining us for the first time? So glad you guys are here. Hey, you should find an information card on your seat or a QR code in front of you. If you could scan that, fill it out, we would love to put a gift in your hand to thank you for being here. And like the video showed, we believe we're better together. So, man, I just encourage you to get in a small group. I promise it'll be good for you and just improve everything in your life because we're better together. And if you don't know me, my name is Charles. I serve as the next-gen pastor here working with kids, youth, and young adult ministries. And I'm so glad to be able to talk with you all this morning. I just want to thank Pastor Stan for the opportunity. And I just appreciate your leadership in my life. And if you were here last week for Easter, Pastor Stan started this series called Exposed. Is this not the most intense sermon series title you've ever heard of? Exposed, the biggest lies Christians believe. And so he's talked about how he exposed the lie that there's multiple ways to heaven and talked about how we need to consider Jesus and that he is the only way into heaven. And today I want to talk about this other lie that I don't necessarily, you know, I haven't really heard Christians verbally saying this lie, but I've definitely, just through experience and through counseling, seen a lot of Christians living as if this lie was true. Okay, and so the lie I want us to talk about today is real Christians don't sin. You know, every service, people laugh. All three today when I said this title. I I love it. We're charged up and ready. So real Christians don't sin. And I, I, I believe I found that this lie becomes a problem of expectations. And I've learned that if our expectations are off, kind of set us up for some trouble. It can set us up for some hardships and for some failure. Take, for instance, my journey of family vacations, okay? So my wife and I, we got pregnant pretty early on in a marriage, six weeks in, and in those first 10 months where it was just the two of us, we went on two incredible vacations, okay? We had our honeymoon, and then we had this thing called the baby moon, which I would highly encourage It's just an excuse to get away again. And it was the best. Vacationing with my wife is the best thing ever. It's fun. So much good food. We sleep in. We take it easy. So much quality time. I mean, it's it's living the dream. I love vacationing with my wife. Fast forward a few years. We have two daughters now. And my wife had the idea of, hey, we should all go to the Virginia Beach for for a week in the summer. And I was like, Absolutely. I love vacationing with you. And the girls are just going to make it better. We should totally do it. And when I tell you that was one of the roughest weeks of my life, it's not because of my wife. It's not because of my daughters. In large part, it was because my expectations were not appropriately set. And I learned, there's just some wisdom for some of you. I learned there's a difference between vacation and a family trip. Okay, big difference right there. Um, A few months ago, we have three kids now, and we went on a family trip, and it was awesome. It was so great. It was exhausting. It was tiring, but it was so life-giving, and it filled my heart. And I think in large part, it was because my expectations were properly set. Like, this was a family trip we were going on. And as we address this lie, real Christians don't sin, I think it's the same way that expectations so often set us up for a struggle. Because to believe this lie that real Christians don't sin, it might be putting an expectation on yourself that God himself isn't even putting on you. And if we're expecting something that God's not expecting, that's a recipe for some trouble, a recipe for for some mishap and, and, and failure. And I think it puts a weight on us that God isn't asking us to carry because our expectations are off. And if you've ever, you know, and I think this is what happens, we can believe a, a lie like this, our expectations are set to believe real Christians don't sin, and then we start to struggle with sin, or maybe we battle with some temptation, and next thing we know, we go down that, that downward spiral of wondering, am I still saved? Does God still love me? Is something wrong with me? I thought I was done dealing with this. I thought that was for my old life. Why am I still struggling with these same things? Am I far away from God? Do I got to earn my way back into favor with God? It is exhausting. It's damaging, it hurts, it's confusing. I think it's expectations that might be set that aren't the way God is wanting us to live, not the way he set things up for us. 
to be. And I'm confident this isn't the way God has intended us to live. That he wants us to live a life that is not filled with shame and guilt and pressure and burdens and insecurities on if God still loves us, but it's a life of security. Security in Christ. Security in who he is. And one that has healthy expectations for our battle with sin and confidence in our relationship with him. And that's what God's inviting us into. And so today, we're going to look into Romans, a few chapters, Romans 5 through 8. Uh, and the hope is that as we broadly walk through this, we're going to address this lie and see what Scripture has to say. And I think as we look to it and we dispel the lie and we establish some healthy expectations and we renew a strong confidence rooted in Jesus Christ by looking at these passages. And I think the best way for us to expose this lie is as we go through Romans, I, I want us to answer three big questions, okay? Why do people sin? Why do Christians struggle with sin? And why do Christians, or how do Christians respond to sin? Okay, why do people sin? Why do believers struggle with sin? How do believers respond to sin? And as we start, I want you just to take a moment of self-reflection right where you are and ask yourself, what are your expectations for your relationship with Christ concerning sin? What are you expecting of yourself what are you expecting of God when it comes to your battle with sin? Let us pray together and just God, I ask that you would fill us today, speak through me. Would you pierce our heart with your word? Open our mind and our hearts to receive what you have for us, God. May we be built on your truth. Encourage us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's unpack this. So this first question that we're going to answer is why do people sin? Why do people sin? Sin And a super common definition of sin, I'm sure you've heard it in the church before, is missing the mark. That's a great definition. Missing God's mark is sinning. I, I like to think of it as leaning on your own understanding or taking the place of God or doing what's good in my eyes instead of doing what's good in God's eyes. So this is what sin is. And there's this theological concept, I don't want to get into all the weeds of it, but a theological concept called original sin. And that's important for our conversation today because original sin, it talks about looking back to Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve in the garden and God gave them the command, you may eat of any tree in the garden but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did they do? They disobeyed and they took the fruit. They leaned on their understanding. They, they missed the mark. They did what was good in their eyes and they sinned. And so original sin, it speaks to the implications that Adam and Eve's action has on all of humanity. It's a pretty big topic. This is what original sin is talking about. And here's what Paul says in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. So see what Paul is talking about. When he mentions the one man, he's talking about Adam, okay? He's talking about Adam, Garden of Eden, what he did. And he's saying that through Adam, he sinned, and through his sin, death came to everybody. Therefore, all of us are sinners, and all of us have, has inherited death. And now the ins and outs, the how we're involved, to what extent, all of that, again, it's not really Paul's focus. What matters here is all of humanity are sinners with a bent towards sinning, a propensity to sin, whose inheritance is death. That's the unfortunate picture that Paul is painting for us in Romans 5.12. And later on in verses 18 and 19, Paul then says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners... So also, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So now, Paul is introducing Jesus to the conversation. Okay, so we have the one man, Adam, and then we have the one man, Jesus. And Paul is highlighting their actions and what they have done. And so he's saying through Adam, uh, his trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. So his choice brought condemnation for everybody. But Jesus, his righteous act, brought justification and life to all people. And then he says in the same breath, through Adam's disobedience, it made everyone a sinner. But through Jesus' obedience, it makes everybody righteous. And so he's holding up th these two figures, Adam and Jesus. And he's making the case that every single person 
stands in relationship to one of these two people. We either stand with Adam or we stand with Jesus. And their choices bring about our eternal destiny. This is what Paul is saying. And so to align with Adam means his sin, his death becomes our sin, our death. But to align with Jesus means his righteousness, his obedience becomes my righteousness, my obedience. Yeah, praise God is right. And the grace is greater than the trespass, is what Paul says, that the grace of God is stronger than the inherited sin and death. And so Paul is, is he's building this picture. So, again, why do people sin? Well, people sin because we're all born into Adam, and sin and death has come to all humanity. And we all have a bent towards sinning. But praise be to God that grace is greater, and Jesus made a way to rescue us from the family of Adam. I made a picture. I hope it, it helps me. I hope it helps you. Don't laugh at it. I did this myself. So listen, this just helps, I think. This is what Paul is saying is, here's Adam. This is Papa Adam, Papa Jesus. Just roll with me. And Adam, he's saying, all of us were born into Adam. So here's all of us. That's us. Okay, that's me. That's you. Here we are. So we're all born into Adam, which means we all are born into sin, inherit sin. Death is our destiny because we are sinners. We're actually in bondage to sin. But then Jesus, and again in John 3, he likens salvation in him to being born again. And so he's saying that by putting your faith in Jesus, you actually transfer from being born into Adam to now you're reborn into Jesus. And so now you're no longer identified as a child of Adam, who's a sinner inheriting death. Now you're identified as a child of Jesus, a child of God. And you inherit righteousness and obedience and eternity with God. It's a pretty great situation right there. And this is the picture Paul is painting. So why do people sin? Because all are born into sin and sinners who sin. But Jesus made a way that through faith in him and joining him in his work, we can transfer over from the family of Adam into the family of Jesus and be in right standing with God. So this is why people sin. Jesus rescues us into his family. I don't know about you, but personally, as a member of the family of Jesus, no longer the family of Adam, I still struggle with sin. And so it makes us ask the question, why do Christians struggle with sin? We understand why those in the family of Adam, but why do those in the family of Jesus, why didn't that stop when we're born again? So we got to answer this. So Paul moves on to Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So again, Paul is saying, yes, the grace of Jesus is stronger than the trespass, stronger than the sin, but that's not a license to go on sinning. He's saying that's not the point here. we got to consider ourselves as those who are dead to sin. And this language is so significant. Paul is not saying sin is dead to us. Paul is saying we have died to sin. It's very big. Sin is still alive. We have just died to it. Let's follow his train of thought going on in verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. So again, we got a picture that when we join the family of Jesus, we're joining Jesus on the cross. We're buried with him. We come to new life with him. Thus we resurrect with him into new life in verses 6 and 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So again, this language is so big because our old self that belonged to the family of Adam, it was in bondage to sin. It was a slave to sin. All it could do was lean on its own understanding. All it could do was do what was good in its own eyes. This is the picture scripture paints for us. Slave to sin. But when we join Jesus and we die with Jesus on the cross and we come to new life with Jesus, our bondage ends at death. So the chains that you wear, you go into the grave, the chains stay there. And you come to new life and now you are free from what used to be in bondage to. 
You all following this? You're set free from what you were in bondage to. So now you're no longer a slave to sin. You've been removed from the family of Adam into the family of Christ, which you're free from sin. And he goes on to say, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And this is our reality for those who have been brought into the family of Jesus. We join Jesus in his death, his burial, his resurrection. We join him in his new life. And we're free from the bondage, the power, the stronghold of sin. We do not have to give into it any longer. It's in this new life with Jesus, God is now telling us we have to consider ourselves dead to sin. Dead to sin. And what helps me kind of understand this is thinking about a breakup or a, situa- or a separation, okay? So my wife and I, we both dated other people before we started dating each other and got married, okay? And it would not have been a good idea if we didn't break up with who we used to date before we started dating each other. That's a recipe for a disaster. It would not have been a good idea. And so catch this. I had to consider myself dead to my old girlfriend. You following me? She's still alive. She's still there. But I had to consider myself dead to her, which means I wasn't looking to her anymore. I wasn't trying to find happiness. I wasn't trying to find joy. I wasn't trying to find intimacy and satisfaction. And I wasn't looking to her because now I had to be dead to it so that I could be fully devoted to Alyssa. You guys see how that works. We had to be, we're dead to sin. We're dead to sin. I have another picture. Don't laugh, it helps. So Adam and Jesus, okay? They're houses. All right, so this is, this, this is what's going on with sin. Is you used to belong to the family of Adam, right? You live, we all lived in the house of Adam, okay? And we, we had sin parties, and we talked about sin, and watched sin movies, and we ate sin sandwiches, and that's what we did in the house of Adam, Okay, but then Jesus sets us free from the house of Adam. We die with him. We raise with him. We're no longer in the house of Adam. We're in the house of Jesus. Okay, we're set free from the bondage of sin. But sin is still alive. That's why I put this magnet here. Because the pull of sin is still very real. We are dead to sin, but sin isn't dead to us. So the pull of sin, the lure of sin, it is so real. I may no longer be living in the house of Adam. I may no longer be a member of the house of Adam. But man, I can still remember what it was like living there. I can still remember what the sin parties were like. I can still remember the sin sandwiches Adam used to make. Like we can still, those things don't go away. They don't just vanish. It's still there. So why do Christians struggle with sin? Because even though we've died to sin, even though we are no longer in the family of Adam, but we're in the family of Christ, sin is still alive and is actively trying to pull us in and lure us in and remind us of what life used to be like before we left. And it wants to bring us back in to the life that we're actually set free from. And so this sets up this tension between the old self and the new self and I hope this helps understanding it because both yourself and the family of Adam and yourself and the family of Christ, the power, the the presence of sin is still real. It's just different. Because when you belong to Adam with the old self, you were enslaved to sin. You were in bondage to sin. You had no hope of overpowering sin. But when when you're in the family of Jesus, the new self, you're freed from sin's bondage. You're no longer, again, captive to it but you still have the lure and the pull of sin very present in your life. That's a big difference. In Adam, you're a prisoner to sin. You can't choose not to follow it. In Christ, you're freed from sin, but it still calls your name. It's still trying to pull you back into what you've been set free from. All right, so Christians, we're those who have been set free from the family of Adam, born of the family of Christ, set free from the bondage and prison of sin and death, but we still experience the pull of sin. So our goal is to be dead to sin, not give into it. But on this journey, we may fail. We'll still struggle. We might fall. So the last question that we need to answer is then how do Christians respond to sin? 
Because if there's still the pull of sin when we're a part of the family of Christ, how do we now respond to this pull of sin? What are we to make of it? And I want us to read a part of Scripture in Romans 7 that is definitely one of the wildest parts of Scripture. Very confusing. It, it's legit like a glimpse of a case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde going on inside of a human being. And it's brought a, if Maybe you care about this, maybe you don't, but it's caused a lot of debates for centuries with biblical scholars. You have half of scholars who are saying what we're about to read. Paul is writing about his old self. Paul's reflecting about when he was in the family of Adam. He's talking about this, the struggle with sin being in bondage to it. And then you have half of scholars that believe, no, Paul's actually talking about the present. And he's talking about currently, as a, in the member, as a family of, of Jesus, the struggle with the pool of sin that that might have on his life. So however you may interpret it, that's not really, and I go back and forth, to be honest. It's okay to have some spiraling. It's healthy. But I want us to read this because it really brings to life the depths of the evil that might be alive in us. And it really brings to life this very real struggle with sin for both the believer and the unbeliever. So let's read this. Romans 7, 19 to 25. Paul says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me? from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So again, it might be confusing, but just follow me here. We have here either a picture of an unbeliever who's explaining his wrestling, his toil, with wanting to do good but can't in of himself do anything good. He cannot rescue himself from the family of Adam. Or we have a believer, someone in the family of Jesus, who's describing how he wants to live for Christ and, and walk in his ways, but this pull is so strong and he struggles battling it and it's still alive. And again, regardless of how you interpret it, I just know, I can just speak firsthand from personal experience before I knew Jesus, before I was a part of the house of Jesus, man, I wanted to do good. I wanted to make a difference in the world. I wanted to contribute. I wanted to, to do good things. But I couldn't do the actual good that only comes through Jesus Christ on my own. I couldn't break free from the bondage of the house of Adam on my own. I couldn't do the good I wanted to do. I also know personally, from my experience, as a member of the family of Jesus, I struggle with sin. I have moments of weakness. I have moments of temptation, moments of failure. I have times where I generally may feel like there's a monster living inside of me because I do not do the things I want to do, but I do the things I don't want to do. And it's a battle with this pull of sin in my life. And I think that this passage of Scripture, again, regardless of how you, what you think Paul's trying to say, there's three implications I want us to highlight that set the foundation for then application I want us to give at the end, okay? So three implication points that set the groundwork for our application. And the first that we see in this is that knowledge isn't enough. Knowledge isn't enough. Guys, if knowledge was all that we needed, man, life would be really easy, We'd all be living our dreams right now. You know what I'm saying? If knowledge was all it took, this would be way different. But it's not. Look what James says in chapter 4. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. I mean, again, this is showing us knowing the good you ought to do does not guarantee that you actually do it. Knowledge does not guarantee doing the right things. I may know how to swing a golf club. That doesn't mean I can do it right, okay? I'm trying. You may know the recipes. You may know the ingredients to a recipe to bake something, but that doesn't mean you can do it the right way, right? Knowledge does not guarantee success. 
Knowledge cannot set us free from the bondage of the family of Adam. Knowledge is not enough to keep us from the lure and the pull of sin, actively seeking us out. Knowing the right things to do, knowing the sin we shouldn't do, isn't enough to respond to sin. Paul also shows us that grit isn't enough. Grit is not enough to resolve to do something to have grit, to dig deep, to strive, to push yourself, to will it. You on your own can not do it. And we all know this from life experience. We can strive to accomplish something and give it our best effort, but that, that, that does not guarantee results. It doesn't. I mean, I know lots of great Christians who love Jesus. Faith is on them, and they're striving, doing their best to get out of debt, and, and they can't. The same way, I know, I know great Christians in school studying and they're trying, they're doing their best to get good grades and they just struggle and they can't. Just look at NC State. They did their best, okay? They had grit, but grit isn't always enough. Grit isn't enough. You cannot, <laughs> grit will not set you free from the family of Adam. Grit will not keep you from the lure and pull of sin in your life. And so in this, in this passage, if Paul is showing us that knowledge isn't enough and grit isn't enough, then what is enough? And he shows us that Jesus is enough. Because remember the end of that passage, he says, who then can free me from this body decaying to sin? Who then can free me from this battle going on inside of me? And he says, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He alone is able to save us from both the bondage of sin and aid us in the war against the pull of sin in our life. Knowledge and grit aren't enough. We need Jesus. So built off of that, I want to now give us four application points as we close, okay? And the first one is for how, again, knowing that knowledge and grit, they're good, they aid, but we need Jesus Christ. Here's now four points to how we respond to the pull of sin. We've got to press into the work of Christ. Press into the work of of Christ. Paul says in Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And again, this is so big, but we so often just forget about it or don't understand it. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in the family of Christ. If you're in God's family, you've been set free from the bondage of sin. That means you're set free from the penalty of sin. The demands of sin have been met in Jesus Christ, the head of your new family. There's no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus took it on. And it's so simple, but we forget it. This means that when you sin, your status doesn't change. You don't change from being a child of God to then becoming a child of Adam again when you sin. That doesn't happen. Why? There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. He's not placing guilt on you. He's not pushing you away. You've been set free. You've been forgiven. You're a child of God. And the status of a child does not change with the mistake. The status of a child does not change because of sinning. Like, Jesus is stronger than that, guys. His blood, his grace is stronger than changing because we slip up. And understand, this isn't a pass to sin, but like this is meant to be confidence. As we battle with sin, this is a confidence we have knowing there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I can get up again. I can keep going. We tell our kids all the time that Jesus loves you if you make good choices, and Jesus loves you if you make bad choices. God's love for you doesn't change. And it's such a simple truth, but man, as we get older, it becomes so hard to believe that. And it can seem too good to be true. But praise God that Jesus is too good to be true. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your status doesn't change when you sin because God's blood is stronger than that. There is no condemnation. So press into the work of Christ. When you sin, don't focus on, man, focus on the work of Christ. Get back up again and keep going. Second, we gotta press into the spirit of God. Paul says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. 
The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. For those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. And man, this is so big, guys. Our identity as a child of God means the spirit of God is alive inside of us, okay? And we got to take comfort. We got to be confident knowing that the spirit's alive inside of us. The spirit of God is actively working to sanctify us more and more like Jesus day by day. This is not an overnight thing. You don't get transferred from the house of Adam into Christ and then boom, you're perfect. No, this is a process. This is a journey. This is me, like he says, setting my mind on the things of the spirit, letting the spirit govern my life, submitting myself to the will of the spirit, allowing the spirit of God to produce the fruit of Jesus in me, doing his sanctifying work in me. And it's not gonna be perfect, but you better believe we are on an upward trajectory of us becoming more and more like Jesus. We gotta press into the work of the spirit that's alive in us. And we can't let sin to be this massive discouragement when it happens. The Spirit of God is working. He is bigger than that. So we got to keep moving forward. And the fruit of that is life and peace. And we press into the work of the Spirit in our life. The third point is we got to present ourselves to God. Okay? Paul, Paul says in Romans 6, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. And so what we're gonna remember, we're we're, we're pressing into the work of Christ, we're pressing into the the work of the Holy Spirit, and now we gotta talk about our intentional choice. Because we press into God, we press into the Spirit, but now we gotta make sure we are presenting ourselves to God. We gotta make that choice. Because what Paul paints here is a picture that, yes, you've been set free from the house of Adam, but in the house of Jesus, we're not chained down. We're not strapped into a seat. We can get up. We can leave. We can go and back and enter back into the house of Adam again. And so Paul is urging us, who are you presenting yourselves to? Who are you presenting yourselves to? Think of that keyboard that Will's playing on. You can present yourself to someone who's going to play the, the, the tune of sin or put yourselves in the hands of God to play the tune of righteousness. Pressing into the work of Christ, the Spirit of God, who are you presenting yourself to? Who are you being an instrument of? The last thing is we gotta establish healthy expectations. Like I said at the start, if our expectations are off, we might be setting ourselves for trouble, for failure, for frustration, for confusion. And so hear me, guys, please hear me. Just because you feel temptations, just because you, you think about things maybe you used to think about, you struggle against the pull of sin, it does not mean anything's wrong with you. It doesn't mean you're not a follower of Christ. To struggle with the pull and the lure of sin, to have moments of weakness giving in to sin does not mean you're a lesser than, weaker Christian. Do you know what it means? It means that you used, you're a human who used to be a part of the family of Adam, who has now been set free and adopted into the family of Christ and the pull and the lure of sin is still very real and it's at work trying to get you while you are on your journey of sanctification pressing into the work and the spirit of Christ. That's what it means. doesn't mean you're a failure. Think of it like this. just, Just hear me out. Right now I'm trying to cut, which means eat less fat, eat more protein and all that good stuff. And y'all know what messes me up the most. Don't judge or laugh at me. But Cane's chicken tenders. I mean, I'm talking about that big plate. Y'all know, like, they have the normal four count, but then they have the six count with fries and toast and the Louisiana hot sauce and the cane sauce. I mean, come on, y'all, like, I, that stuff is good. It's really good. And so hear me out here. Before I was cutting, I used to eat that. And I loved it. It was really good. But now that I'm cutting, I have to make myself dead to Cane's. Hear me, I gotta make myself dead to Cain. Now let me ask you, do you think Cain's is still calling my name? Yes. Do you think the pull of Cain's is still active in my life? Yes. 
to, for me to think about it, for me to think about the moments me and Cain's had, that doesn't mean I'm a failure. Hear me out. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm losing. It doesn't mean that at all. Even for me to give in to, to it for a moment. I had it for dinner last night. That doesn't mean I'm, listen, no, no, no. It doesn't mean I'm a failure. I'm still on that upward trajectory of cutting and doing what I want to do. So listen, when it comes to sin, y'all got to understand. The pull of sin is real. God bless Cain's. The pull of sin is real. <laughs> and don't be unrealistic, guys. Don't expect that you're not gonna struggle with temptation and the pull of sin. Like, that's just not real. Don't expect that you're not gonna have moments of weakness and fail. That is not realistic. This last passage I want us to look at is in 1 John 2, and it really helps us establish healthy expectations. John says, my dear children, writing to believers, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Cool, so this is the first part of our expectation. We're making it our goal. Remember, we're dead to sin. So I'm expecting, I don't want to sin. I'm gonna strive to live a life of holiness like God is holy. I'm gonna live for Jesus, live like Jesus. I'm gonna do what I can to walk the course and not give in to sin, okay? That's why I'm expecting that life. Look what, James, look what John says. But if anybody does sin. So now, this is part of the expectation. That sin is not the norm, but sin is the exception. Okay? So I'm expecting, I'm going to live a life of holiness. I'm going to set my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to live like Jesus, for Jesus. And sin is the exception. It's not the norm. So when it happens, I understand. This is just, this, I'm going to get back up again. That's our expectation. And then he tells us what we can expect from God. This is where it gets good. Check what he says. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Y'all know what this means when it says advocate. This means that we can expect Jesus as we're on our journey, our upward journey of following Jesus, becoming like Jesus. When we sin and mess up, Jesus is our advocate. That means he's standing at the right hand of God saying, hey, God, he's with me. I've covered him. I brought him into my family. Just because he's sinning doesn't mean we've lost him. I got him. He's our advocate. And we got to expect that from Jesus. Confidence will rise. And then look what he says. He is the anointing sacrifice for our sins, and not just for mine, but for the sins of the world. This is so big. He's the anointing sacrifice, so that means all of our sins are covered. He has paid the price. So I'm expecting Jesus to be my advocate, and he is the anointing sacrifice. I've been forgiven. I am forgiven. I will be forgiven. Because, guys, God's just that great. The grace of God is just that strong. We've got to set healthy expectations as we go on this battle. As we fight against the war of sin, pulling and luring us in, we got to know he is our atoning sacrifice. He has paid the price. We are covered in his blood. I am fully a child of God as I was yesterday and I am today. I'm going to keep being a child of God as I'm on my journey of living for Jesus, living like Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 So don't believe the lie, guys, that real Christians don't sin. It's just going to make life a lot harder for you than it needs to be. It's going to make life really difficult and bring tension that you don't need to have. God's not putting his weight on you, so neither should you. So can we, just, can we understand that we're either in the family of Adam or in the family of Jesus? And if we're in the family of Jesus, we need to have confidence and know we've been set free from the bondage of sin. It no longer has control over me. And now I am dead to sin, but the pull of sin is still very real. We gotta know that in response, our knowledge and grit isn't enough. It's not enough. And we need to press into the work of Christ, press into the spirit of God, present ourselves to God, and have healthy expectations for our battle with sin. As we all go on this journey, can we be a church that doesn't beat each other up? That doesn't like put the magnifying glass on the sin, but we put the magnifying glass on God? That we amplify the voice of God, not the voice of sin and temptation in each other's life? Can we be that kind of a church? that encourages one another to keep going, to yes, you, fought, you fell, but get back up again. Keep on going. You are secure in Christ. You're just as much a child of God still now than you were yesterday. You don't got to earn your favor back with God. You're still in God. Keep on going. Can we be that kind of a church to one another? That we're moving together on this journey. And if anyone, you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never received the forgiveness he has for you, I, I believe he's calling your name today. 
And this is what's so crazy about the gospel. Like, all you got to do is turn and believe. If you put your faith and receive the salvation of Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And you will be transferred from the family of Adam into the family of Christ. And you can begin this new life, the way life is supposed to be, with Jesus. So I just want to lead us in a short prayer for anyone that wants to make that decision today. And God's calling you by name. And it's my prayer and my hope that you would respond to the call he's given you right now. If you guys just bow your head and close your eyes. And if you're someone that you're saying, I want to respond, I want to receive the free gift of salvation today. I just ask you to repeat this prayer after me and say, Father God, I acknowledge my need for you. And I thank you for what you did for me on the cross. Thank you from ri for rising from the grave and giving me victory. And I receive your forgiveness. And from this day forward, I commit myself to living for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.